Hello, shalom, and welcome to this episode of Congressional Conversations, where we discuss the priorities of New York's Jewish community with members of the New York Congressional Delegation. I'm Michael Miller, Executive Vice President and CEO of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, JCRCNY, and today, hailing from the 6th Congressional District in Queens, we welcome Representative Grace Mank. Representative Meng serves on the House Appropriations Committee and its subcommittees on commerce, justice, science, and related agencies, as well as the subcommittee on state foreign operations and related programs. She's also on the Homeland Security Committee. She's a very busy Congresswoman. Uh, she's also the co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force on Combating Antisemitism. So important for us in the Jewish community. Thank you. She's the first vice chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, uh, known by its uh, acronym, C-A-P-A-C, K-PAC, maybe? Uh, <laughs> and she is the co-founder of the Congressional Kids Safety Caucus. We were just talking off camera about her kids uh, and a vice chair of the Congressional LGBTQ plus Equality Caucus. Welcome, Congresswoman Grace Meng. How wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. Um, let's talk about, let's start off talking about uh, the pandemic. Uh, that's pretty much preoccupied us over uh, the, the past 14 months approximately. So at this stage in the pandemic, uh, what are your primary goals in providing relief for your constituents? What are the, some of the things that past relief bills have provided that you want to make sure your constituents know about? Sure. Well, thank you for asking this question. This has been really on the top of the minds of not just my constituents, but people all across the country in every single district. And especially here in Queens and New York City, our district was really the epicenter of the epicenter. Absolutely. And New York got hit with COVID early on. We had no roadmap. We literally did not know what to do. Um, if you think about back in the beginning, we didn't even know whether to wear masks or where to get testing, much less vaccines. Um, and so we really sort of created that roadmap for uh, much of the rest of the country. Um, and I still remember colleagues from around the country asking us how we were handling this um, in New York. Um, and so, you know, we, as we are beginning to hopefully recover from this pandemic over one year later, uh, Congress has been able to work in a relatively quick manner to get relief uh, into and uh, to help the families of folks here in New York City and across the country. Um, you know, one issue that I had worked on before the pandemic, which really uh, became highlighted during the quarantine period, was the issue of affordable internet access. Yes. Um, 12 million students uh, before COVID hit had no access to devices or the yeah. internet, could not do their homework. Um, and so we were, even though it was a rough time, we were able to make some progress on this issue because people, more people across America realized how important internet access really was, not just to students, but for telehealth, um, for folks who are working. And so we're glad to make some progress and hopefully we'll be able to start providing affordable access to everyone, just like we do for electricity and, yeah. and clean water. Um, one, you know, one area where we really heard from were our small businesses. And mm -hmm. I especially want to give a shout out to small business uh, owners in Queens, because they were really amongst the first to weigh in and tell us what Congress needed to do. And even when we did it, they told us how we needed to make the laws better step by step. Um, and so we were able to provide um, programs you've probably heard of like PPP and, yes. and IDLE. 
And in this newest reiteration of the law, I want to make sure because a lot of people still don't know that we have a new Restaurants Act that is included. It is a $25 billion grant. It's not even a loan that your favorite local restaurant could apply for. It helps cover payroll to rent to the structures that people have had to build for outdoor eating. Um, and we really hope as the Small Business Administration unveils the guidelines that our restaurants in New York can apply for it and get help. Well, that's so important. And there's so many, and in your district in particular, so many small businesses, then they've really taken a, a, a hit during the course of this, of this pandemic and particularly uh, the restaurants, I don't know if the, the money is going to help improve uh, the, the, uh, the quality of the food that's being served, but hopefully that <laughs> hopefully that be part of it too. Um, I'm just curious, we, we, you just mentioned about, uh, about internet access. How, how did your kids fare uh, with their schooling during the course of this past year? Well, so my kids were home from school. They attend New York City public middle schools, which were remote for most of the year. So they're home. One, one kid finally went back to school. Life has changed a lot for me. Um, but, you know, we've, we've been, you know, on most good days, we were lucky to have internet access. Um, but, you know, there's, there are always mishaps. Um, and that's just something that we've had to, to balance. Um, but we still are luckier than many folks across the country who don't have access and who might have to sit in the parking lot of a fast food restaurant yeah. or go to the library if and when yeah. it's open. Yeah. All right. I, I remember those those early days of, of trying to find somebody who had a Wi-Fi and just kind of hang around and, uh, uh, you know, whatever that word is uh, to, to be able to utilize their Wi-Fi. But uh, let's talk about another uh, much more serious issue that's been impacted by the pandemic, and that's food insecurity. Um, so how has food insecurity been exacerbated by the pandemic it was there before, uh, but no doubt it was impacted during. Um, and what does Congress do or can Congress do to provide for people uh, in need? And, and what, what is this pandemic electronic benefit transfer, uh, PEBT, that I, I've just been made aware of? And, and how was that gonna help New Yorkers? Sure. So this is one of the most serious situations that we saw during the pandemic. Um, we saw food pantry lines uh, at organizations that we probably always knew existed, but the lines increased maybe tenfold, twentyfold. In some parts of our district here in Queens, the lines went around the blocks. Wow for hours on end. And it's really heartbreaking. I remember there was a story of one little girl who said that she had to go to the food pantry for her family because her parents, uh, her mom had to work and her dad passed away from COVID. So this is just one of the heartbreaking stories that so many families in New York uh, have had to face. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to organizations like Met Council and Masbia, who we've worked very closely with. Hmm. They are always um, working hard to feed people even way beyond the Jewish American community. And also to highlight when and how we can improve uh, the way New York City and our government distributes food and how we can be more effective. The PBT uh, program that you just mentioned is sort of a stimulus for kids. Um, this is about $400 that goes to each New York City kid whose school receives free lunches. So it covers not just New York City public school kids, but some kids at yeshivas and other parochial schools schools um, as well. And this was administered just like how our SNAP benefits in this country are administered. Um, mm. And it literally helped, um, you know, help feed children because kids were home, families are home. Um, and a lot of families who might have lost their jobs or struggled with loss of income really needed that extra boost of help uh, in feeding our families. Yeah, so actually, you, thank you. You mentioned SNAP, uh, which for our viewers is a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, used to be known as food stamps. Uh, what are you advocating for now with regard to SNAP? Well, look, SNAP is a wonderful helpline um, when it's needed. 
However, this pandemic has really highlighted for me some gaps in our laws, uh, as crises often do. Um, and so we realized and we heard from essential workers in our district who were making maybe working two, three shifts, didn't have time to buy groceries. We learned from them that they couldn't buy, for example, hot or prepared foods. So they couldn't buy a cup of soup if they were in between ships. They had to buy, you know, maybe uh, cold uh, foods, ingredients that they had to go home and cook. People don't have time um, to do that, especially in a pandemic. And mm -hmm. if you bought a sandwich, if the bread is toasted, it didn't count. If it's wow. not toasted, it counted. And so there are examples where, let's say, this is what I did during law school, where I would buy a rotisserie ch chicken and use it for multiple meals, but they're not allowed to buy that because it's a hot prepared food. Uh -huh. So these are some of the gaps um, that I think we can fix in the long term in our laws. Oh, certainly, particularly uh, during this very stressful period uh, of, the, of the pandemic. Speaking of stress, let's shift to another issue, which is very much in the top of the news, and, and that's hate, uh, anti-Semitism, hate crimes, and particularly the hate crimes directed towards Asian American Pacific Islander community, the AAPI community. Um, you are the sponsor of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, H.R. 824. There's another act called the No Hate Act. Uh, what do these uh, measures do in order to tamp down, uh, if not even attempt to uh, uh, eliminate uh, and combat uh, the hate which is plaguing us? Well, thank you for raising this issue. And I want to say maybe this is late breaking news. But as we speak, the Senate has now taken up these measures in a bipartisan way. We went from a, a one party bill into a bipartisan bill, which is very exciting and novel sometimes in Congress. And it's going through the Senate uh, as we speak today. Um, this legislation really uh, just provides more dedicated personnel and resources at the Department of Justice to make sure that the federal government is collecting data on these types of incidents. You can't really fully solve a problem until you know, uh, have a full picture of how serious the situation is. And that's true for these incidents as well. It also provides for easier ways for people to report these incidents. Oftentimes, as leaders, we just tell victims to make sure you report it, but that's easier said than done sometimes. We want to make it easier for people, and we want to give our local law enforcement guidelines on how to more effectively investigate these types of cases. Yeah, um, if my, my staff can please put up on the screen my production team. There it is. Um, we are now conducting a campaign, Congresswoman, in support of your legislation, as well as the No Hate Act. Um, and as you can see, and everybody can see on the screen, uh, it is done in as broad a diverse way as possible. Uh, we're partnering with the Asian American Federation, with the Korean American Association of Greater New York, with COPA, which represents South Asian Muslim population and greater Muslim population, the Hispanic Federation, uh, NAACP, and uh, of course, our, our partner, the UJA Federation of, of New York. Uh, to date, we have, these are the, the, the top seven, uh, but we have more than 50 not-for-profit organizations that as we speak now, you're talking about what's happening in the Senate. So as we're speaking now, um, already signed on to this, uh, and we hope to have uh, quite a number more uh, that are going to be associating themselves with New Yorkers support the No Hate Act and the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. And on behalf of all of us, I really want to thank you uh, for your leadership in, in this uh, space. Uh, no hate is no hate against anyone. COVID hate crimes are against anyone. Um, and the, the hate which is being directed towards the AAPI community is unconscionable uh, and uh, it needs to end. Uh, similarly, with regard to the hate against our Jewish community, against the black community, against the Latino community, against all communities uh, needs to come to an end and government can play a significant role. Thank you for that. And, and 
Uh, I also know that you're a, you can take the, the graphic down. Thank you. Uh, I also know uh, that you are the sponsor together with the Queensborough president, Donovan Richards of a march on, on May the 2nd. Uh, that's a week from this coming Sunday, May the 2nd at 1230 PM uh, from uh, Flushing uh, Town Hall. It's a march against hate. It's called uh, We Belong Here, Queens Rises Against Hate. It's a solidarity march. Again, beginning at 1230 PM on Sunday, May the 2nd from Flushing uh, Town Hall. Paul with a hashtag of a uh, hashtag stop Asian hate. Do you want to please tell us about uh, this rally about this march? Sure. Well, first, I want to say thank you to JCRC and to all the organizations that have made it possible uh, for us to uh, get this legislation over the hurdle. I will say as an Asian American, it has meant the world to me and it has been incredibly heartening to see such a widespread showing of support from so many communities beyond the Asian American community. The Asian American community in many ways it's, is, is pretty young uh, and at uh, early stages of learning how to use its muscles and vocabulary of advocacy. And I will say in my experience that I myself have learned how to be a more effective advocate from leaders in the Jewish American community. Um, and so I'm, I'm incredibly thankful uh, to so many who've spoken up. Um, our borough president here in Queens, Donovan Richards, has uh, also been relentless in trying to bring different communities together and to stand up against discrimination against anyone. Um, and so I'm really thankful that he's spearheading these efforts for this uh, multicultural march on May 2nd. We will be highlighting uh, a few leaders from our various communities. Um, and really just to say, you know, no to Asian hatred, but against discrimination towards any community and that we all belong here. Oh, absolutely. And JCRC has lent its name as a, as a partner uh, to, to this effort. And I just call upon everybody who views this before May 2nd, some might view it afterwards, uh, we'll be on YouTube and Facebook, but if, before May 2nd, please join us, please join the, the Congresswoman, uh, the borough president, uh, myself, and many, many, many others on Sunday, May 2nd, uh, 12.30 p.m. at Flushing Town Hall. I'm sure there'll be a lot of publicity about it. You'll, you can get the address, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why is there so much hate right now being directed against the AAPI community? I think, you know, in this country, there is a long history of uh, discrimination against the Asian American community, often out of ignorant fear. You know, we've seen uh, pieces of our history where uh, it's been codified uh, into law, actually. And we can talk about instances in our history, like the Chinese Exclusion Act, where Chinese people were specifically prohibited from becoming citizens by a law that passed through Congress, um, or the Japanese Americans being yeah. put into uh, internment, internment camps. camps. Yeah. These are all real parts of our American history. And I think at the time when this virus was coming out and people uh, really didn't know much about the uh, virus, um, there was again, a, a level of ignorant fear. Um, and of course we can certainly talk about the origins of the virus and all that, but we can do it in a responsible way without putting a target on the backs of Asian Americans in this country. Yeah, so absolutely. And I, I also want to, to thank you for your support of our Jewish community. And we were suffering right before the pandemic hit from a horrible wave of anti-Semitic activity. Um, and you have been there with uh, our board member, uh, Shimmy Pellman, and many other leaders in the Queens uh, Jewish community to stand together and in the central Jewish community in New York as well, to, to stand in solidarity with us. Um, and therefore, we need to certainly stand in solidarity uh, with uh, the Asian American community. Uh, but the things that we need to do as well, uh, yes, uh, serve as, as advocates, but the Nonprofit Security Grant Program, uh, which is a federal program, and you have been instrumental in ensuring that funds are 
now made available uh, in the millions of, of dollars nationally, now up to $180 million uh, for synagogues, or we would say in Yiddish, uh, shuls for schools, you mentioned yeshivas uh, for, for churches. Um, can you talk to us about this program and the potential for even increasing the amount of money which is going into it? Sure. Well, this is one of my favorite programs that we work on, and we've been able to expand funding over the years. Um, you know, this is a program that literally helps non profit organizations um, keep their congregants, keep fellow Americans safe. What better way to use uh, funds from our government to ensure that we are protecting the lives of everyday Americans as they worship in many cases. So we have been able to increase funding. And again, want to thank JCRC New York for its tremendous leadership in getting the word out, helping different organizations apply, um, and for just being such an outspoken advocate uh, to expand this program. Yeah, the program is, is so crucial to us. So we have a community security initiative, our CSI, with a, a full-time uh, uh, community security representative uh, in Queens. Uh, we also have one in Brooklyn. We have one from Manhattan, Staten Island, one from Westchester, the Bronx, one from Long Island. Um, we have these, these security managers, um, and but there's somebody who is a retired uh, police officer um, who uh, is just responsible for security of Jewish institutions in Queens, but we go beyond the Jewish institutions, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, we started now in Brooklyn, a interfaith uh, coalition of uh, houses of, of worship, interfaith. So it's the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community representatives of all different faiths, of Christianity, of Islam, uh, of uh, Buddhism, uh, who, whichever the, the, the faith may be. Uh, so it's not just something which we retain within the Jewish community, but it's so important, and you spoke to it earlier about the role that the Jewish community plays, but beyond just us, it's, it's, it's we, it's not just us. Um, and it's so important that we build bridges, which is the metaphor of our organization uh, to, to other communities. And, and speaking about, about building bridges, let's uh, finish up this conversation talking about the state of Israel. Um, back in December of, of 2010, Yes, uh, it was a bit more than 11 years ago. We had uh, the honor and pleasure and privilege of accompanying to the state of Israel when you were then in the New York State Assembly, uh, one assemblywoman, uh, then assemblywoman, Grace Meng. Uh, you were there together with, with your, your husband, uh, again, at your own expense, but um, it, it was just uh, an incredible experience for us. But maybe you could share with us a little bit about your experience uh, then and uh, we'll talk a bit more about Israel. So I, I want to, again, take this opportunity to thank you, Michael, and the JCRC team for inviting me on that mission trip to Israel. It was my first ever trip to Israel. I had never been there. Um, I had grown up uh, in and next to uh, Jewish communities my entire life. But I say to people now that that trip really changed my perspective mm -hmm. on the importance of issues that face the Jewish community, not just as the state of Israel, but how it relates to us here in America and to protecting democracy in general as a whole. Um, that trip was the first time where I got to visit Israel and talk to parents and families um, in Israel, who talked about the importance of the United States of America uh, supporting safety measures that literally protect families, so many who are families of my own constituents here in Queens, New York, uh, every single day. And it's trips like that until you can take a personal trip and witness yeah. the beauty uh, of mutual support and friendship uh, and allyship. Um, with the state of Israel and the United States of America, um, you don't have a full, un you can't have a full understanding of, of this beauty and why uh, it's so important and so essential uh, to protecting us here, even in the United States. And so I'm still very thankful uh, that I got to take my first trip to Israel with JCRC. <laughs> And I hope that we we'll find a way of, of uh, taking a second trip, not your second trip, but a second trip with JCRC uh, sometime 
in, in the future. But I think, as you know, on a more uh, serious note, that there are those uh, who are critical of, of uh, taking of, of, of even uh, associating themselves uh, with with these these trips. So what do you say, for instance, there, there, there is a questionnaire being circulated by the DSA uh, for New York City Council members uh, asking them whether they would decline an opportunity to go to Israel. What kind of message would you say to a city council candidate who would approach you and ask whether you should sign on, whether they should sign on to that questionnaire or not? Well, I would tell them that I would tell them about my own personal experience and why it's important to visit not just the state of Israel, but but to any country. Why would you ever close your hearts and minds to uh, an experience like this? Um, and especially as legislators, especially as public servants uh, at various government levels, we want to learn as much as possible about other cultures and how it relates to our own community and how it can improve relationships right here in our districts. Um, look, many of us were disappointed to see a question like that uh, contained uh, in that city council questionnaire. Um, but I also think that one of the good things that came out of it is that we were able to have a somewhat public, uh, mostly on social media, but somewhat okay. public discussion on why questions like that and limitations like that uh, aren't uh, helpful at all um, and how I will continue to encourage people to visit the state of Israel. We have seen so many opportunities where uh, the United States and how we uh, protect and how we fund many programs in the state of Israel directly benefits us here. We talk about the Iron Dome program and how it protects so many people in Israel, but you know what? We've also been able to work together to make sure that that same program and that same type of project is now protecting our own service members uh, in parts around the world. Um, and that's just one example. I will say that, and this is not meant as a criticism, we can always do better. Um, what we need to talk about more is the humanitarian aid that Israel and techn technological uh, advancement that Israel makes and provides to so many peoples around the world. I don't think we talk enough about that. And I mm -hmm. think that that is something that um, we will continue to, to spread the message about. Well, thank you so much. And that's a wonderful way to uh, wrap up this uh, incredible conversation. I, I, I love uh, having a dialogue with uh, Congresswoman Gr Grace Meng, and this was no, no exception. Uh, before we, we part company, are there any last words that you'd like to leave for our viewing audience, uh, Congresswoman? Well, Michael, I want to take this moment to especially acknowledge and thank you for your efforts. And I would do this even if you weren't in front of me here today, as I've done <laughs> often in front of other audience, Jewish or not. Um, your leadership and your willingness, even outside of times of crisis and hate, um, are an example to all of us, whatever community we hail from. Um, your willingness to engage in honest, and mutually supporting dialogue and actions and how ready you are always showing to be willing to stand up uh, with and for other communities is uh, such a beacon of light uh, here in New York City and across the country. And I appreciate you for showing solidarity always, not just in words, but by actions as well. We, especially in the Asian American community, are going through a tough time right now, yes. but I strongly believe that as we continue to work together, we will come out of this uh, stronger than ever and more effective than ever. In New York City, we often live in diverse communities, but side by side, um, not necessarily working hand in hand as we always uh, could work do more of, um, and I believe out of these crises, um, stronger relationships will come out of it. Well, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for your friendship uh, and for your, your partnership. It's, a, it's an honor really to uh, be associated uh, with you, Congresswoman uh, Grace Meng. And I, I thank you so much for coming on to this program uh, together with me and associating yourself with JCRC in New York. Uh, look forward to working with you and with your team uh, to advance those important issues that we spoke about uh, today and, and many others uh, as well, and certainly to stand together uh, with the Asian American community as the Asian American community has stood together uh, with us during times 
of, of distress. Uh, and so to our audience, we thank you as well for, for, for viewing, for watching, to learn more about the issues we talked about today. Take a look at our JCRC website, jcrcny.org, www.jcrcny.org, and our 2021 focus on communal priorities. We look forward to seeing you next time on Congressional Conversations. One more thank you, uh, expression of gratitude to Congresswoman uh, Grace Meng from the 6th Congressional District uh, in Queens. Thank you all for viewing. Shalom. Goodbye. See you again.